Hello, everyone. Are you guys able to hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, we Maria is heading down. I just ran from downstairs up here to admit people in. We are getting conference room C set up. Little short staff today, but Maria should be in there. And it looks like we are still waiting for a quorum, so we're going to probably take about another five minutes or so. So, yes. Whoa. All right. <laughs> that works. Okay, good. So, for everybody that's joined us so far, thank you very much. We are waiting for one more member of the task force so that we have a quorum. So, we'll just give it another minute. Uh, looks like we have Paul Blues in from the Super fire duper. district. So, I think should that puts be okay to go. Okay. So I just want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming to our task force meeting today. We do have quorum and I, good. It was, all right. Uh, who's taking roll call today? I can do that. I think Andrew is going to. Yeah, I can get to the slide. Are you guys seeing the slideshow? Yes. All right. So our agenda for today will go through the roll call in consideration of a minute of our minutes from the last meeting then we will continue our conversation on zoning and license types allowed in the county of lake really with a focus on what we currently allow and whether or not we want to adjust that while also reviewing the table from the lcca and reviewing what we currently don't offer but would perhaps consider offering so with that said go ahead and move on to roll call All right, Ruby, why don't you take roll call? Okay, and then do I have to announce the people that are here? Uh, they'll, uh, they'll say who it is, but just go ahead and read off that list. Oh, okay. Um, so roll call of task force members, North Lake County, William Wise, South Lake County. Wait, wait till William, wait till Will says he's here. Willie, okay. Here. Will's we here. Could, we can okay. hear you barely. <laughs> And then uh, South Lake County, Jan Coppinger here. Um, Agriculture Commissioner, Catherine Vanderwall. She let us know she wasn't gonna be able to attend today. Okay. And then uh, Farm Bureau, Rebecca Harbor. Do Rebecca in the Zoom room? We do. We do. Okay. Yes. And then, Present. Uh, Present. There. Okay, okay, there we go. Perfect. And then Jennifer Smith, and then uh, Cannabis Industry, Nara Dolbaca. I don't see her on Zoom. Did she say anything? She might not be. She had a uh, dad in the family. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, and then uh, Tribal Representative, Robert Geary. I don't see him online either. Robert. All right, and then um, LCFCA Representative, the Fire District Chief, or the Representative. Blue Spill Fire. Super. Hey, perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Moving on, uh, we now have our consideration of the minutes from the May 8th, 2023 task force meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review those minutes? If so, we're ready for a motion. Super ready. We, we have a okay, let's open it we up. Have a couple of we have some public input. Holly, go ahead. We cannot hear you. I see that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Maybe star six on your end, Holly. All right, Holly, while you work on the tech, we're gonna go ahead to the next caller. Uh, go ahead, Bart. Holly just sent a note, I can't read it. And Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if Holly is uh, about to uh, identify the same thing. On my screen, what I see is the minutes are identified for the same date as today. So there's a some sort of typo there that just Difficult seems like that. a mistake. Oh, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I could so, read 
You're saying, okay, uh, Bart, if I hear you correctly, you're saying that the minutes for the last meeting have today's date on them. Is that correct? That's what I see on my screen. Okay. All right. Hey. Hey, um, Andrew, would you happen to have a copy of those minutes that you could put? Yeah, up give me one second. Let me Super. let me get those up. Because Holly just put in the chat that I think Sarah was listed as a task force member. So we'll want to get that corrected because, yeah. Sarah's a regular, but she's not a member. And I couldn't hear. Is Jennifer Smith present today? Jennifer Smith is here today. She's present in the, in the room. All right, so we'll give Andrew a minute to get those minutes up there and um, then take a look and see if we need to make any amendments. Okay, I apologize for that delay. I had the draft minutes here. We are, you guys can hear me, right? Um, yes. Yeah, we are in the middle of a transition from Catherine Schaefer working on the minutes to Ruby now working on the minutes. Um, Ruby, I, I wasn't sure where you'd save those. I was looking on the E drive. Uh, is this the draft that everyone received from May 8th? It, it sounds like Holly may have received an updated version of this. Well, we'll see Sarah on there. I should be listed as not present. Okay, so we'll make that amendment. Are you making note of the amendment? Yeah, Great. Go ahead and close this one out. This doesn't look like the copy. I, I don't think that I received a copy of the minutes. Uh, let me go to the website. Thing. Okay, so well, Holly says that it was not attached, but she don't she downloaded it from the uh, from online. All right. I will see on. Um, the email mm -hmm. that I received. This is Rebecca. Just had links to everything that's online, and I did. I actually didn't find the minutes online. Yeah, I'm this, this is this is Will Weiss, experience. and I have the same experience. Okay, so it sounds like we missed the minutes online. Let's go ahead and table that for our next meeting. Well, can we talk about though that that in the the uh, agenda set out, uh, what's important about what just got said is that people received links, but they couldn't necessarily access what was indicated, and so in that way, this meeting i'm sorry to say is not brown act compliant this meeting so long as the agenda was posted is absolutely brown act compliant but if we did not have the minutes then that was an inadvertent error or omission and we will go ahead and not take action on those minutes today because it was not available to the public we will go ahead and move those minutes to the next meeting for consideration and approval and then somebody had just commented that the meeting, the minute meetings are available on the website. Kyle. Oh, Kyle found them. Okay. Yeah, just to let you guys know. Where are they? Um, well, so when you're, when you're on the website itself, yeah, I just so like you through. Under boards and commissions. And it's this little, it's this little guy right here. Okay, so they should have been on the May 22nd agenda, but they were attached to the May 8th. Because these are the minutes that we were supposed to approve from May 8th today. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I thought that's... Because I opened the May 22nd and they're not available under the May 22nd agenda. So did they maybe get attached to the May 8th? Here's the agenda for today. Okay. And let's see. You know, I apologize. I'm not... I was told they needed the prior minutes. So did you... Yep. Okay, so maybe you put them on the 8th then. Let's well, fine. We'll get this figured out. Yeah, generally we had sent out in that courtesy email the draft minutes. However, we're kind of getting away from adding too many attachments to the emails because everything's available through links online. Um, however, we don't post minutes on to the website until they are approved. So we would have needed to send those out to at least the task force members and the, the public. So we'll get those sent out or post to have a place where draft minutes can live online. So I'm also hearing some other noises. Is it Holly trying to speak maybe? Correct, they're on the line item for May 8th agenda. Thank you, Kyle. 
Um, Rebecca is commenting for task force members. Can we please include all docs as an attachment moving forward? Um, sure, I think, yeah. Okay. We will do that. Thank you, Rebecca. And I think that's all we have on the chat. But for today, we will go ahead and carry those minutes over. Next on our agenda. Review of zoning and license types allowed in the County of Lake. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and take it from here and just uh, pick up where we left off the conversation. Uh, we're gonna basically, again, referring back to this rough outline of what the new, Zordin, new zoning ordinance on cannabis, commercial cannabis could look like. Um, we've gone through the purpose. We dealt with a handful of one-off issues from the Board of Supervisors accordingly. And now getting back to that comprehensive holistic approach, we're into zoning and licensing, which does kind of feed right into uses permitted. Um, sorry, I'm still hearing like a, a noise yeah, from um, Holly. Uh, Bart and Holly, go ahead and mute yourselves, please. Thank you, sorry about that, Holly. We can see your comments in the chat, Holly. So if you wanna go ahead and write in any comments, I'd be happy to read those out, so. Okay, well, with that said, our zoning and licenses will directly affect uses permitted, whether through a zoning clearance, a zoning permit, a minor use permit, and a major use permit. Um, again, as you're becoming more familiar with this table B, 27.11B, um, this is what the county currently allows. We're going to go through each row one by one and explain what all of those mean. Um, and again, this is the table from the LCCA with a summary of their recommendations of how they'd like to see that table uh, changed a bit. So, um, Andrew, uh, just before you get started, I wanted to interrupt for a moment to make note for the record that Nara Del Baca has joined us at 117. Oh, actually, she joined at 113. I, I meant to mention that, Super. but we we're in the middle okay, of the thanks. minutes Sorry conversation. Keep going. Um, okay, well, moving on, and I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, essentially, I'm going to go through each of these different license types for what we currently allow. Do you, are you guys able to see my cursor on the screen? Yes. So we're going to just kind of do a brief summary of what type one, two, and four are, then hit upon type three. There's subsections of these license types. So again, not to be too uh, boring, I, I, I'm going to try to move through it quickly. Um, we'll get into each of these licenses, what they are, where they're allowed within the zoning ordinance. And as you can see, this uh, basically a, a hollowed out circle represents a minor use permit that would be required. And then let me go to the previous slide. Uh, the, the darker circles represent a major use permit. Okay, uh, moving on. So with a minor use permit in our ag preserve, ag timber preserve, rural lands, rural residential and suburban reserve, uh, applicants are able to pursue a license type one specialty outdoor. Um, again, in this first title, it's outdoor cultivation for a medicinal or adult use cannabis. All of these license types could be applied for in the M and A. So I left that out of the rest of the section um, with out the use of artificial lighting in the canopy area of less than or equal to 5,000 square feet of total canopy size on one premise or up to 50 mature plants. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. And again, anyone who, you know, any of the task force members who want to stop and ask some questions, feel free to, to jump in at any point. Um, but with that type, these are the zones that a type one license is allowed with a minor use permit. Um, with a major use permit, they could pursue one in uh, planned uh, commercial development. And then these following zones are where we do not allow the license type, which again is open for discussion and consideration moving forward should any task force members wish to, to use that. We will have a PDF of this PowerPoint. It might be useful to go back and use as a reference. Um, and then with that said, I will continue to move forward. So. Um, within the license type one, we also have a license type one for specialty indoor. Uh, it's essentially a similar square footage, although similar, but not the same between 500 and 5,000 feet of total canopy in size with indoor cultivation, which is in a permanent structure and exclusively using artificial light. Uh, currently, we do not have a lot of people in Lake County pursuing indoor license types. 
uh, mainly because throughout our growing season, we have access to so much sunshine. So finally, we have a uh, license type 1B, which is a specialty mixed light. Now, this is uh, when you when you see mixed light and you may wonder what that is for those of our task force members and community members who are not as familiar with cannabis cultivation. It's exactly like it sounds. You're using a mixture of natural light and artificial light, typically in a greenhouse, glass house, conservatory, hot house, or other similar structure. Um, and this can incorporate the use of light deprivation as well to block out sunlight when, you know, when it's part of the plant's growing process. Um, a key fact in this type license type is that the artificial lighting is below a rate of 25 watts per square foot. Uh, between 2,501 and 5,000 square feet in total canopy size. Again, you can pursue it uh, in most of our zoning districts where we do see cultivation through a minor use permit. It's APZ, Ag, Timber Preserve, Rural Lands, Rural Residential. Uh, major use permit, again, in plan development commercial. And then it's not allowed in those following zones. All right. To move a little more quickly through this, a license type 1C is a specialty cottage uh, license type, which essentially it's similar to the others. It just uh, it's 2,500 square feet or less. So it's really for a small scale grower, but you can find all the details for the specialty cottage uh, within those license types. For type two, small outdoor license type, again, covered in that first row of the table, uh, it's an outdoor cultivation for cannabis without the use of light deprivation. Um, however, actually, with the changes in, you'll see in our type three, I would cross out this section with light deprivation that has been opened up. Um, and uh, again, this is between 5,000 and 10,000 square feet. So just a little bit larger than the type one license types. Again, similar for a small indoor and similar for small mixed light as well. You guys can go back and refer to this. I'll be sure to edit that part about light depth. Uh, finally, in that first row, we're still on row one up here. We also have type license type four nurseries for cultivation of cannabis solely as a nursery. Um, while our explanation doesn't really get into the details, one key thing to keep in mind here is that nurseries need to operate on separate premises based on DCC regulations, and they are taxed not on square footage, but on gross receipts. Um, as mentioned in the last meeting, you know, the nurseries, the clones get distributed to other cultivators. So it's a, it's a cultivation business for other cultivators. Uh, then we get on to our most common license type that we see throughout the county is a license type three outdoor medium, which is outdoor cultivation for adult use cannabis with out the use, and again, due to the regulation change, would take out the light deprivation, but without the use of artificial lighting in the canopy area at any point in time. And it's from 10,001 square feet to one acre uh, inclusive of total canopy size on the premise. Um, again, applicants can pursue a type three through a major use permit in ag preserve, ag timber preserve, rural lands, uh, rural residential, suburban reserve, and planned development commercial. Next, we have a type 3A, which is the equivalent counterpart for indoor of a type 3 license. However, it doesn't go up to a full acre. For those who aren't familiar, an acre is 43,560 square feet. So you're getting at, uh, you know, just above a half acre here. So... But again, we don't see a whole lot of people pursuing indoor just because there's so much access to natural sunlight here. Uh, you see indoor cultivation more in like Colorado, Michigan, New England states, but California uh, does not really necessarily uh, need to go that route. Uh, but again, we do see a lot of mixed light actually because this can enhance the speed and quality of the rate of growth. Um, but uh, for type 3B mixed light medium, Again, it's in a greenhouse, glass house, conservatory. Uh, it's also at a rate below 25 watts per square feet, and it's similar. Uh, it's the same square footage as the indoor. A license type in manufacturing, and this is where we're going to get into a little bit of uh, some of the caveats or some maybe areas that you're less familiar with. 
with the type in the yeah. Could I ask a question, just going back to cultivation, and this might be for uh, Jennifer or Sarah, um, with the introduction of Type 5, the large uh, cultivation permit or license, did they break that up into mixed light and indoor as well? All I remember is the outdoor one. Um, they do. It's uh, five acres for outdoor and one acre for mixed light, and I will verify that. Okay, and what about indoor? Indoor, I don't think they changed. Because I thought the, the, the type 5 just means there is no limit. Like, no, it's up to 5 acres. Only up to 5 acres. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Yeah, meaning that you no longer well, have the individual 10,000 square foot permit for each segment of that. So yeah, it's, yeah. So it's a batch. But instead of a type 3 outdoor, if you went to a type 5, you'd still be limited to 5 acres. Yeah, so then you'd have fewer licenses that you have to apply for because it would yeah. be in, in a 5 acre increments. And are they allowed, I know before the state only allowed uh, an applicant to apply for a single type three. Is that, has that been released? Yes, that's been, so the okay. medium, there's no limit on anymore. Okay. And then is there a limit on type five? There are not limits on top five, but there, okay. if you have a type five, it does prohibit you from having a distribution company. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah. So that, I, the it's large seemed... indoor is um, more than 22,000 square feet and the new large mixed light is more than 22,000 square feet and I will get the limits on those for you. Cool, thank you. Yeah, that's- I just um, bring that up in this presentation because it may be something that our task force wants to consider given that there's a new license type available at the state, we may want to make a recommendation that we add something into um, our ordinance to come along side or, or to to add in everything that's available at the state all right yeah Thanks, that, Drew, sorry. You no that's fine that that makes total sense and that's a, it's a good point whereas this presentation is just focused on what we currently allowed mm -hmm. uh, with plans to cover what we don't allow but have the option to add to the ordinance at the next uh at the next meeting and again let's say you have 10 acres you want to cultivate 10 acres you would need 10 type 3 licenses uh, previously 10 type three licenses for one acre each, whereas with the new type five, you could do two type fives to cover that 10 acres. So. And Rebecca Harper just left the meeting, but we still have one. The hop off, okay, all right. And um, you actually only be able to do one type three and then stack a bunch of other kinds of licenses on top. Okay. Oh, okay, single. thanks for that clarification. It wasn't just, yeah, it wasn't just a... Uh, I didn't hear what you just said, Nara, sorry. Nara, could you repeat that? Oh, uh, well, it's not the not the case anymore, but yeah, it used to be just, uh, you would have to do one, we could do one type three and then stack other license types, the smalls on top of that. Okay. Yeah, and basically, uh, long story short, with, with the current system, the, the amount of stacking of licenses at DCC was uh, quite extensive. I mean, I think the cultivators can relate that they there's a number of licenses that they would have to cover. And the effort here with some of the changes is to simplify that. Um, and also, I, I think it has quite a bit of potential to reduce the fees. So, all right, moving on, type P, type N and type P manufacturing. Uh, type N manufacturing is manufacturers that produce edible products or topical products using infusion processes or other types of cannabis products other than extracts or concentrates. A type in license may also package and label cannabis products on the license premise. Uh, they're allowed through a minor use permit in C2, C3, M1, M2, and PDC, more of our heavy commercial and industrial zones. Um, type P is similar. It's in the same row on that table, and it's manufacturers that only package or repackage cannabis products or labels or relabel the cannabis product container or wrapper. Uh, manufacturers that engage in packaging or labeling of cannabis products as part of the cannabis manufacturing operation do not need to hold a separate type P license. Uh, going on type six manufacturing, this is generally the type of manufacturing we do see uh, still to a limited extent within the county, but potential for growth. And the key thing about type six versus type seven, both on, well, each one has its own row as to where it's allowed. Uh, which is down to the key factor that this is non-volatile solvents or no solvents. So the manufacturer cannabis products, it should be an of cannabis products for cannabis use, 
using non-volatile solvents or no solvents as, as defined by the business code, business and professions code, section 4100. Again, type six has a lot more availability in different zones where you could pursue type six manufacturing. Um, but as you can see in the next slide, when you get to type seven, it's limited to just uh, heavy industrial zones because you are using volatile solvents, uh, which are much harsher on the environment. Uh, type 11 distributor license. Uh, our applicants can pursue this in C3, M1, M2, and plan development commercial, and is the procurement, sale, and transport of cannabis and cannabis products between entities licensed pursuant to California code. Uh, license type 13, distributor transport only. It's the transport of cannabis goods between entities licensed pursuant to California code, where it kind of differs here with the type thir type 11, which involves the procurement sale and transport. Uh, type 13 and then type 13 self-distribution, which we see the mo majority of our cultivators include a type 13 so that they are able to distribute their product themselves. Um, there's certain requirements. They need a secure staging area to hold it, um, but you would be able or you, to distribute your cannabis product, let's say from a cultivation site, from your farm to a processing facility. We have seen issues where it's been kind of concerning where the uh, permittee was approved for their cultivation within a canopy area. However, they did not include the self-distribution license and they were in some tough situations that uh, they had to deal with as far as getting their, when their own processing kind of fell apart and they needed some help, they were limited. So, you know, keeping that in mind as we consider distribution uh, is something to, again, keep in mind. Um, again, type 11s, they tend to stand on their own though. This is if you're gonna start your own company to basically move product from other sites, whether you're going from cultivation to a processing facility, then to a manufacturing facility, then to a testing lab, which we'll get to in our last section. Hey, Andrew, if I could just interrupt again, going back a couple slides to the distribution transport self only. Self only? Yeah, for, those, distribution. for the permittees that we have um, that have wanted to add that on, since there's no impact to the environment, we've been handling that by just making a note in the file because there's no no extra um, background checks or anything like that. It's not going to have any sort of impact on the environment because it's just using existing roads. Um, and so uh, people, we haven't made people like modify their permits or anything. We just make a note in the file that that's adding on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. All right, cannabis processor license. This on um, the DCC license types is included as a cultivator cultivator license for cultivators that only trim, sift, cure, dry, grade, package, or label cannabis, and uh, it's allowed through a major use permit with APZ A timber preserve and rural lands. Um, and it's generally it goes with uh, it would go with a cultivator license, some type of cultivation. Uh, license type eight, cannabis testing laboratory. Uh, it is a license for a testing laboratory. Hey, Andrew, uh, which, sorry yes. to keep interrupting, but I was That's under fine. the impression that if you're a processor, you can't have a cultivation license. You may. You may? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it just means that you're doing your stuff and anybody else's stuff. Correct. That's what the Okay. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, thank you for clearing that up. That's why we, we have seen situations where, you know, our cultivators have their own processing on site. And again, with, you know, some of the cultivators who didn't have the self-distribution, they had, you know, they were affected by the weather or other situations to where they couldn't process their own cannabis on site. And, you know, an easy fix would be to go to one of their, you know, neighbors who was also cultivating and had a, you know, perfectly available processing facility. However, they did not have the, uh, let me go back here. Yeah, can you go back to that slide? Because I was... Yeah, they that's, you know, let's say their neighbor had a processing facility they weren't using. We saw a situation like this. However, they didn't have the cannabis processor license, so they were reluctant to let the neighbor use their own license because they did not want to be in violation. Right, so. well, because processing is allowed within a cultivation license. 
right? For, for your own. Processing, you, but you'd have to get a different license to do your next door neighbor's processing. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yes. All right. Anyway, cannabis testing laboratories. It's the testing of cannabis for contaminants and concentration of various chemical compounds. We currently do not have any of these within the county. Um, they're allowed in C2, C3, M1, M2, and PDC zones. I imagine and there are, it would be real nice to get one of these, wouldn't it? It'd be fantastic. Yeah. It would be nice. Um, some applicants who are pursuing projects, let's say in like a C2 zone, um, I don't, from what I've heard people, most of the, the people in the industry are pursuing cultivation and I believe there, I'd have to go look up the details, but if you're going to do a testing lab, you you're only doing a testing lab. You can't be a cultivator and own your own testing lab too. I think the yeah, you DCC can't has be listed right. on, yeah, you can't be listed on any, anybody else's it's license. It's the only standalone license. license. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can't be a financial interest holder in any I mean, even right. if it's not they want to avoid any conflicts, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're almost through this. Thanks for bearing with me. It's not the most exciting presentation. Um, but uh, row 11, license type 12, micro business. Now, uh, this uh, through a type 12 license, you may act in part or whole as distributor, type 6 non-volatile cannabis manufacturer, and cultivator on an area less than 10,000 square feet. An applicant for micro business shall have all of the following license. And this is straight out of Article 27, um, our cannabis ordinance, which could amend, because we limited a little bit more than DCC regulations limited. Um, and we just have one combination that we allow for with type 13, which has your self distribution, your type one or two for a small cultivation, and then type six non volatile cannabis manufacturing license so, so type yeah go ahead Sorry. yeah just type six types ones and twos and type 13 so so the big thing that's missing as part of the micro business that lake county doesn't allow is um retail yes and we so did not cover something as as we move forward since there's already been discussion about possibly allowing retail in um, along with cultivation or something it might open up the option for micro businesses to then have retail as a possibility depending on what what you all think yeah so at the state it's cultivation manufacturing distribution or and retail you can not, you need three of the four mm -hmm. and exactly you don't necessarily need to be all within the same um, municipality really yeah so wait you could have a micro business in lake county but do we be doing your manufacturing like in sonoma correct oh that's interesting or you could do your manufacturing and your you know type one or two smaller cottage industry and distribute it and then do your retail out on like main street at a you know in a different town so huh. Huh. interesting company okay. Um, however, that, that kind of concludes it because this is just a summary of this table 2711B. Um, with that said, we can, at our next meeting, expand upon it into all the things we do not offer that LCCA was able to highlight within their table. Unless they want to go visit that table, talk to about it, you know, in length or it's open. I'm opening up for a conversation among the task force members at this point, so. We're prepared to go into um, discussing all the license types that currently aren't available, as well as um, zoning for each each license overall. We have some other recommendations. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, is there any, what, do you want me to go back to this table or do you want me to pull up that other document that you had sent? Um, just as a, a, a note, we're missing both our agricultural commissioner and our um, Farm Bureau representative, so we may not want to take any action as far as recommendations go yet, because that's yeah. missing both of them. We wouldn't be able to. That there was no consideration on the agenda. So yeah. So if if you all want to present today, that's fine. I would just ask that we wait until our next meeting to take action on recommendations. I think that we should start to present just because we're here. Go ahead, and it'll give everybody more um, background knowledge for further discussion. Yeah, and it doesn't there. hurt to give everybody time to think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. it's a lot of decision making. Yeah. Oh, wait, one other option. 
sorry, I just want to mention one last thing. One other option, should anyone be interested, I do have ArcGIS Pro open with our approved and pending projects and all the zones if you want to reference a map to see where what is available. Um, just let me know. Okay. Before we jump into the table, um, this is Sarah, Policy Director for LCCA. And um, at the last meeting, we proposed an approach, which was to begin with considering all of the facilities type zoning first um, as part of a strategy for the task force to instead of piecemealing things and taking one little sliver at a time, like just talking about nursery or just talking about retail, to lump everything that was not cultivation together in one batch of recommendations and then address cultivation separately um, after that. And for people who weren't here for our presentation a couple weeks ago, the reason being that the, um, the need for the, the facility, some of these facilities is imminent and could even be relevant this, this calendar year and this growing season and a full rewrite of or changes to the cultivation ordinance are going to have to go through um, probably more robust CEQA review and definitely wouldn't happen in time for this growing season. So from the perspective of, of licensed and permitted cannabis operators in the county, it would be most strategic for the task force to tackle the facility stuff, which is everything that's not cultivation. Um, first, get that batch of recommendations moving through the process for input from all the other agencies and then the board and then do cultivation. So that's how we structured um, what we focused on. And that's what we're prepared to dive into today. And as far as zoning, we don't have any cultivation changes recommended. So I think we're okay. safe to just go ahead with the facilities. Yeah. yeah. And, and we may, once we open that up and start looking at it, we may want to look at some nuanced things, but we're not addressing those today. So then what's assumed in that process is that uh, we would provide sort of an update to the board about the recommendations regarding facilities as a unit while we're while the task force is still talking about cultivation. Okay. Yes. Yeah, let me kind of wrap my head around that one then. And that, you know, I, I was looking to the minutes to see if we officially voted on that because I know that Jenna and I presented that at the last meeting as an approach, but I don't know if there was any action taken and if there needs to be for the task force to say, yes, we like that approach we officially are voting for that approach to do facilities first and then cultivation second. I just couldn't remember exactly how that item ended. I, I don't know that we actually need to vote on that sort of directional process. It still all fits under review of zoning and license types allowed. Um, I think we'll, we'll, since we're not taking action on it today, we'll reward it differently in next week or next meeting's agenda. Um, just so it does allow for us taking action. Um, but does anybody have any sort of issue with divvying it up into two different pies? I'm not seeing anything here. Any uh, task force member have an issue with breaking it up and dealing with facilities type first and then going back and talking about cultivation? I'm not seeing anything. That, that's fine by me, Will Weiss here. Super. Okay, Paul, do you have any issue with that? Nara? I'm, I'm good with that. Okay, good. Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, so we don't have any um, recommendation changes until you get down to type seven, volatile cannabis manufacturing. And to, to us, it really makes sense to add those options into M1 and MP. Those are manufacturing zones and should be, um, that's ex exactly the type of zoning where we would like to see manufacturing. Um, and we, if you wanna pull up any definitions through this, I welcome the conversation. Um, type 11 distributor license, which is the um, distribution where you can distribute yourself and for yourself as well as um, other farmers. We'd like to see that opened up on the, the cultivation zonings, which would be APZ, A, TPZ, RL, RR, and SR, especially because as we have these buildings that are being built um, for these particular uses for the different, um, what do you call them, uh, capacities and use types that we can build out accordingly and be able to have those distributors um, already on site. 
the same would go for self for transport only. Um, to us, the transport only is really the benefit to the farmer and so that they can deliver their product, whether it be to a testing lab or a distri distribution center themselves. And so it makes sense to have those licenses available on those cultivation spots. Wait, do, hold on, just so I'm clear, do we not allow transport only self-distribution on uh, to be paired with? For some reason it's not on the chart, although I know that you can apply for it. It just wasn't on there. Okay, so maybe we just haven't updated our chart. Yeah, all right. Um, there is, I think, about a two-year lag between what's been um, adopted as far as ordinances and what's made it onto our online. And so we are working on that. We, we are working actively with Municode, which is the company, or maybe they're called Civic Clerk now. But anyway, with the, the same company that updates all the rest of the county code, we're getting um, zoning code updated. So hopefully that's, uh, that should be happening soon. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then the next one that we wanted to address would be the cannabis processor license. And again, this is. And, Andrew, could you put the um, the grid back up for the group? Thanks. So this processing, as we know, comes with cultivation at both the state and local license. So what we're specifically speaking of here is a facility where somebody um, is operating as a processor. They're either drying, trimming, um, co-packaging for other for other entities okay. and so we would like to see that in the commercial zones as well as the manufacturing zones because we believe that the um the processes that are taking place which commercial zones? Match. um we have it in c2 and c3 okay not c1 no okay and i've got the list of, of county zones up here um c1 is more like shopping centers exactly. small stores restaurants yeah. offices um, kind of like you know professional setting um like downtown type areas c2 is also similar to that because it allows for like your hardware stores your restaurants your cafes as well yeah it can be but when you look at the maps um it can be a bit more of a, a mishmash and so i think that that's where like the use permit process allows you to look at a site specific location and is it right next to an auto parts store or is it right next to a restaurant? You know, mm -hmm. like there's, there, it, it's kind of case by case because the, <laughs> we don't have a big county, right? So sometimes when we have zones that are exclusive, it means like a good location can be ruled out, but it's not actually like a downtown neighborhood. Are you thinking that exclusions would be added into the ordinance? Because otherwise, if it's zoned for it, um, then it falls to the planning commission to decide if it's okay to be next to a restaurant, you know, but either way, the department would support the project because if we didn't have any reason to not. I'm not suggesting exemptions specifically or, or exclusions rather. Um, I think that it's more like, and I know we, we don't want to use terms like this in policy, but like common sense, like mm -hmm. there, if, if, a, if an operator were going for that, it might be that it's in that zone, but it's very appropriate, very appropriate use. And there would be a lot of opposition and it would fit well with that neighborhood. That's kind of what we're thinking for this. Okay. Jen, uh, do you want to add? You could, ha you could have, I mean, yes, yeah, so there's, I mean, just to, to answer that. And then I have one, one thing on the type 11. Um, I mean, there's ways to, uh, to add in, certain findings right where yeah yes you could have a processing facility and then you know add add in a couple of you know of additional findings to to be able to to grant that discretionary permit um and that might help protect you know if, if it was a really inappropriate location and staff you know didn't want to have to um, recommend approval if there were you know a couple of findings that had to be made that might help um and then on the one, one additional thing on the ability to add the type 11. One thing that you can do a type 11, I'm not sure folks know this, that you can't do um, with the type 13 is to send your product to, um, to testing. And right now you have to uh, transport, if you have a self, self distro license or self transport license, you can take it to a distri distributor who can then take it to, um, to either retail or, uh, or testing lab but you're not allowed to do that currently under a type 13. And so that's just, it's um, for some of the, 
you know, the smaller, smaller folks are um, mm. just want to kind of cut out that, that additional layer. Uh, and I think a lot of people misunderstood that and applied for type, um, type 13s when, um, and then realized that they were holding a license they couldn't do a whole lot with. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so that's they, also they the reason to expand that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just, just for other task force folks who, who may not be aware of, of that difference between those two license types. Okay. Thank you. What else after processor? Um, and then we also suggested M1 and M2. For a processor? Yeah. For so C2, C3, M1, and M2. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And then we have no changes in the testing laboratory, especially because um, that is a standalone license. And so no cultivator will be holding one, therefore it doesn't need to be allowed in cultivation zones. Mm -hmm. um, the micro business, um, because we are adding in uh, processing and manufacturing into these zones, we think that it should mirror those same recommendations. So we're recommending that um, micro businesses be allowed in the C2 license, the C3, sorry, zones, as well as M1, M2, and MP, specifically the MP because we're asking to have volatile manufacturing, which would be part of a micro business license. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over the retails, which are the black um, R's for recommendation because we've already handled that in a previous task force and have approved those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And just a note on that, we didn't indicate on this chart whether it was a minor or major use permit, but the, the previous more detailed zoning chart that um, the task force contemplated included those recommendations. So we just put an R in here, but it was mm -hmm. directed by the task force whether it be major or minor. For our next meeting, can we get that other one as well? So we can talk about yeah, yeah, and I sent that out in the previous meeting as well. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. incorporated in this format, but yeah, it's yeah. very detailed, multi-pages. It's in the minutes for last week's meeting. It was submitted. Okay. It was it was attached to the to that one. All right. And we 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 fleshed it out in greater detail based on the zone. Yeah, it looks like we just got it up button. here now. And this is what the yeah. task force agreed upon. Okay. okay. And we broke it down more, like with kind of what specific retail we were suggesting um, with a little bit more nuance in there and also compared it to the other uses that were allowed in those same zones okay. for that discussion. So it's, it's a little oh, but bit But that was specific to retail. Yes, it was yeah. specific to retail and it was specifically excluding micro business from that because that at the time was the direction of the board. So the current table is more inclusive. Okay. Uh, but doesn't indicate major versus minor or any other conditions of approval that the group discussed. Good. I believe we did upload this to our website, although I'll have to confirm that. And if not, we'll get it, we'll make it available very soon. Uh, just hey quickly, the, the county may want to add um, one at one of the, uh, the a county micro business license type because there are so many farms that are over 10,000 square feet. Um, I don't know that it actually makes it any easier for, for an operator to, to have a, a county micro business when you, you know, you still have to apply differently at the state anyway. Um, but, you know, in, in some way to acknowledge in the code, you know, this, this desire for a vertically integrated industry. Um, and particularly, I guess, for, uh, well, I guess you'd still do three out of four, even with a large, um, even with a type five, uh, cause you, you just wouldn't do distro. Um, so uh, we, I, I don't know whether, you know, there's room in the code to do that or whether, you know, we, we even need to. Um, but I think that was part of our, you know, part of our mission statement as, as the task force was to acknowledge and encourage more vertically integrated businesses. And yeah, and we do. We have a lot of folks well over 10,000 square feet who may want to participate in a slightly easier, you know, check in a couple boxes um, similar to how you've been handling the self-distro, um, making it a little bit easier uh, threshold than applying for a, a full, you know, additional use permit or reopening a use permit, mm -hmm. but doing it as, as, a, as a simple mod or something like that. So that's it. 
So on the note of um, supporting vertical integration, though, the next two lines where we have made recommendations are around something that's currently allowed by the state of California, but we just haven't enabled it at the county level, which is um, cannabis special events. And the, um, the what's that? Did I say something? No, I was just, go ahead. Do you want me to keep, I was just going to take this part, but that's good. Sure. Okay. Um, so you apply for a, an event organizer license through the state of California, and then once you become a, a, a licensed event organizer, then you can host special events per the local code. So if the city of San Francisco allows special events, then you can apply to host a temporary special event there. And you could also do so here in Lake County, but we don't have that option yet. So the, this is... This line that allows temporary, uh, for, that says temporary special events is to enable that application at the local level. And we've recommended that in several zones. These special events could take the form of, you know, a, a farmer's market. Um, there could be a fair, there could be a, an event and you want to have a, a smoking area, um, not connected to the beer garden, but similar to the beer garden in a different place. Um, all of those types of things are available and are highly regulated by the state of California. You have to have an approved retailer and follow all of the same metric rules and everything that you do, but it would allow that to be possible. So that's what that, that line is, and we've recommended it in several zones. I think what's important to note here is that um, the development standards of how the event is to be held is, is very clearly outlined at the state level. That isn't anything that we really need to work on um, here locally. Locally, what we're responsible for is uh, determining which zones that those are allowed in. Because once we have the zones, somebody has the license, then they apply to the state for that particular event. And what is your reasoning um, with allowing it in the service commercial and the manufacturing zones? It's like you could have a street fair anywhere. You know, the, the, this is this is a cannabis special event could take many different types of forms. Um, like there could be a, a public event and you want to have a little cannabis lounge added on. It could be an event that's hosted in um, the the outdoor area of one of your license holders in the county. So they could be located in many different places. Does that answer your question specifically? Sort of. I don't know that I agree, but. Sort so of. would it be like the Emerald Cup in Santa Rosa, that type of event? Is that what It can be that. It could be also be just a ticketed dinner that's an infused or a pairing dinner. Um, so it really runs the gamut. Or a farmer's market where there's a, a few local farms that are all showcasing their goods. Not the same as, you know, your, your food farmer's market, but that kind of setting. Mm -hmm. I just have trouble envisioning a farmer's market next to an auto body shop. Well, I... I can think of an example from uh, New Belgium Brewing in Fort Collins, Colorado. They do Tour de Fat every September, and it's, it starts with a parade through the town, then people end up at the brewery, and then back in the industrial section. They have the industrial areas kind of gated off, but they have like events throughout the facility um, in that industrial setting, in a sense, to kind of show the, the complex. So, I mean, that's where I'm thinking of an event that's actually in an industrial setting. And the reasons I have the, the asterisks there are to mirror what we recommended in the retail and that it would have to be ancillary to a, a cannabis business already existing in an operation. Mm -hmm. So we're not just going to go behind the auto shop and have a, a big old, a big old right. tasting. They would have to have already a manufacturing license. Okay. Or some you know, I don't, I, I'm not sure I, I necessarily agree with that just because there may be folks who are operating a, a business um, in those zones who may not be it may not be a cannabis business, but maybe they want to allow for a cannabis event to come onto their site and to make a little extra money. Um, and I don't know that that would necessarily be a bad thing if it's a, you know, if it has the same security as a, as anything else does. If you know. So that raises an interesting question that then the task force will need to consider if you wanted, if the task force wants to recommend it in all of these events or all of these zones, would they then require it to be a, an accessory use to an existing cannabis permit business or would that not matter? So, but that's yeah. just something for, that's just 
yeah, something for the task force to consider for next week when we start working on recommendations. Yeah, or is it exactly like a county permittee, right? It's a it's a Lake right. County farm, but the event isn't necessarily on on that site, but it's still and, associated with the local permittee. So and what I would just caution there is to not have that as a blanket discussion, because I think consider each zone when you consider if it should be attached to a candidate business, business or not, because <coughs> zones are very unique and that could be highly limiting to require that in some places. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions, but events generally take cannabis out of it. I don't know that that falls into a zoning matrix, right? I don't mm -hmm. know that the, a zoning based district influences what type of events may be handled there unless there are events already called out in our zoning ordinance um we do have yeah. a permit for special events that are, does not include cannabis at this time and let me take a look and see where that is does, does it address the base zoning where the uh, it does yeah let me take a look we, we are seeing a situation where someone is having or you know pursuing hosting weddings and ag preserve on you know parcels that are under Williamson Act contracts, which is not allowed through our zoning ordinance. Right. So I was yes. going to talk to Rebecca yeah. after the yeah. meeting about this. R L R R S R C one C two C three C R C H and M one. Oh, and then P D C. So almost all of the ones that you just listed. Yeah, I, I know that there are a number of wineries also that are looking at you know potentially adding on a. Um, doing a, the ability to do a cannabis event and things like that. So, interesting. Yeah. Well, cool. okay. What's next? Um, nursery, which we added into all of the. This is and remember, this is a freestanding nursery that can sell to other um, to cannabis cultivate mm -hmm. cannabis cultivators. So we added that same license into the cultivation zones, as that seemed to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then the last one that we, and I think that what's important there to note is that those are non-flowering immature plants. Um, and then manufacturing S, and this is the shared facility where you could have a commercial um, cannabis kitchen, and then you are sharing and allowing other cannabis licensees to come in and manufacture their product. And we recommended that in M1, M2, and MP. One thing that the um, city of Berkeley did uh, several years ago was they had a, a former um, Japanese nursery that wanted to convert to cannabis and they wanted to convert to retail nursery cannabis sales. So it was direct to, uh, to consumer sales that may be, you know, a license type that we want to look at here too. We're opening that as well. Does the state allow for direct nursery retail? Yeah, if they yeah license. if they're allowed to have a retail limit per oh they can okay because I thought it was just licensee to licensee it's a it's a separate license that it would be allowed at the local level okay right you'd have to apply for retail either delivery or you know some kind of a a, a type ten license yeah okay but, so we have quite a list of stuff to talk about next week yeah I mean next meeting. Yeah. So another, um, the limit the limits would apply though, like the, the purchase limit. So you could buy sure. you could only purchase yeah. six plants. Um, yeah. instead of if that nursery were to sell, you know, on a B2B scale, it would be very different. On a B2B scale? Business to business. On a sorry, business to business oh, 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 scale. Okay. Sorry. All right, we're learning your jargon. So a question on this, if if the shared manufacturing would be a umbrella over say for example you had a shared manufacturing facility that was all non-volatiles non-volatiles are now allowed in c3 this is the recommendations that you're seeing right so but in the recommendation i don't see c3 um for shared manufacturing so uh it's already there under a yeah, type uh, six but but it's still a distinct right, but it's not in the recommendation. So because it's already allowed. No, um, change. No, but the shared por the shared portion isn't. We don't have a shared. That's a, that's a good point. So we should consider if everywhere that manufacturing is allowed, do we want to allow shared manufacturing as well? Okay. Uh, okay. We can discuss that yeah. next week. Yeah. That is a special state application. So the state would be asking you all to to weigh in on whether you allow it when somebody applied. 
the idea with the you know above where it is is that's allowing you know in in areas where cultivation is happening we're not necessarily going to allow the shared use manufacturing in areas where cultivation is happening but we could but that's anything else if you guys are interested i could go through the zoning map here and highlight each zone as to where it's allowed versus where the recommendations are changed, if you'd like to see that. For example, here we have, let me close this out. So on our zoning map, here's M2, looking at the first set of recommendations for type seven volatile cannabis manufacturing license. Currently it is limited under type seven to just M2 zoning. So across the county, that looks like this. Down in the Middletown area to Hidden Valley Lake, we have a couple of areas with M2, a uh, couple up towards Cobb. You can see it highlighted there in the yellow. Again, close this out. A little bit of the symbology. But uh, there's, there's not a lot of M2 zoning throughout the county. A little bit in Kelseyville. In fact, that's actually a new processing facility that was approved. Um, a little bit here, but uh, yeah, there's not a lot available. However, if we go back to the LCCA recommendations, uh, let's see here, type seven, opening it up to M1 and MP would look more like M1. I do not have MP highlighted on that. Uh, I think because we do not, do we have manufacturing parks? I know we, we have it as an option, but I'm not sure if we have many zones. I don't think I've seen them. Yeah, so um, opening it up, it looks like, you know, the, it it doesn't expand it a lot, but here's an example where it's limited to, you know, let's, if we want to see what kind of parcels are over there. We've got a couple of parcels where you could do volatile manufacturing. It would open it up to a little bit more space here. Um, down, looks it looks like we've got something opened up here, a few zones open up here in the lower lake area but this kind of gives you an idea of you know you're not expanding it too much it's still limited to just a few pockets where we allow that type of heavy industrial or uh, moderately industrial applications so moving on to our next license type type 11 which it looks like is currently allowed in c3 m1 and m2 let's take a look at what that looks like and stop me if you if you feel like this isn't necessary. Um, this is interesting. E3, M1, and M2. I'm going to pull this so I can kind of see the table a little bit. Oh. Okay. For context, this is this is what we did on a very large printed out map when we were looking at these original zoning recommendations, mm -hmm. so we could conceptualize like where are these areas how much of the county does it impact and where does it look most appropriate um and we had big printed out lines which might be helpful for the group i personally find it hard to see the big picture on a screen when we're moving around like this but maybe that's something that the county could provide for the next meeting and have them available so you can look and see color-coded where these zones are before we take action and make a vote okay that's well i would love to do that i it's our I'm just wondering about the workload. We've got a lot of, it's that time well, it's of year where projects then, are trying. Right? It's not, it's not this, um, we wouldn't be doing it per every one. We just have the big zoning map. Yeah, I think what we did is we selected and then they were colored and then you could just see, okay, where is C1? And go look and then decide if you want to look. Well, yeah, there. that's our zoning map. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Anyone can access that and those. reference the chart and, and see where they're at. Mm -hmm. But we can ask Simone to make a couple big ones. Yeah, I'd like to print some out, just have them in front of me. It would be easier than uh -huh. back and forth. Okay. Okay. Well, I can uh, hold off on that if we're going to go that route. Going back to the presentation then. Yes, at this point, uh, if there's nothing left, we or nothing else left, we can open it up to public comment. Um, let's see. 
Bart's had her hand raised since the last item, so I don't know if that's a new one. And then oh, Nara's beef. hand is still up. We can maybe we could do public comment yeah, first I can put and it come down, back sorry. to an update. Okay. So. so do we have anybody wishing to comment from the public on this item? If so, raise your hand in the Zoom room. Um, other than Supervisor Green, I don't think we have any public here today in the room. And I do not see any hands up. So we will go ahead and move on. Let's see. Okay, so our next item then is update to task force department update. I just wanted the task force to be aware that the board did adopt the um, ordinance for the exempt agriculture building permit for temporary hoop structures for commercial cannabis. That just rolls right off the tongue. I have to always prep myself to get that right. Um, that will go into effect on June 15th, but we are currently um, working on updating our actual form. We have an ag exempt building permit form for what we've been doing it previously, which was barns and things like that. Um, but we will have uh, a customized ag for the temporary hoop structures um, just so that it takes out some of the stuff that's not a, not a applicable for the barns and puts in the items that were approved in what is now ordinance 3132. So I think um, if uh, uh, Andrew, what do you think about just uh, attaching this as a or let's get that uploaded on our website. So um, specific to our cannabis task force information. So if people are looking there for the final product that they can find it there. Just to make it easy. Um, next is the retail um, cannabis recommendations that this group approved. Uh, I, I would like to see that at our second meeting in June. Uh, I don't think I can make it on June 8th. I'm telling Ruby right now, so she'll have the, she can follow up with me. Um, but I should be able to get together a staff report for that and we'll need to do a public hearing notice also. Um, so let's take a look and see. Uh, I think that, that agenda is already stacking up pretty quick. Yes. Um, so, but we'll look to that. That'll be a, that is a tentative date until we publish the public hearing notice and then it's in stone. So I will keep the task force updated on that one. And I think that concludes my update. Can you think of anything, Ruby or Andrew? No, that, I think that covers everything unless we want to, uh, again, we kind of had a pretty good summary of expectations for the next meeting. If there's anything else anyone would like to add to that. So my understanding then is for our next meeting's agenda, we're going to go over these recommendations again. Um, we'll have large maps and um, and we'll uh, we'll be able to make actual recommendations from the task force at that time. One thing that we I, I need the task force to know is that with the uh, change, since we're not in the COVID emergency anymore, the ability to for for actual task force members to attend virtually has gotten much tougher. So for the next meeting, we have to have a quorum of members in person in our conference room. And if you are unable to meet in person, I can't, there's like some reasons that are restrictive that Ruby is going to send out to everybody. Um, so if your reason to attend, if you're an actual member, this doesn't apply to the public because we want to keep doing the, the hybrid because it's just really convenient. But for the decision makers, um, if your reason to attend virtually qualifies, we're going to need your alternate location where you will be attending that meeting because that gets put into our agenda. And um, I, I believe members of the public are able, you have to allow, leave it open, right, for members of the public to um, to be able to attend if they want to. Is that right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. And, and so because we want to keep the maximum opportunities for public input and public attendance, um, we'll be meeting here, but we're also going to maintain this Zoom room hybrid style so that we don't have to fit 50 people in the mm -hmm. conference room B. It's just a lot more convenient for, for people if they can attend remotely, so we're going to keep that as part of it. This just applies to the decision makers, so the actual members of the task force. 
Yeah, I, 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 that's what I was I was talking. I think that if you are able to um, present, I think the adequate, you know, whatever it is, um, reasonings for that, then if we send you the location, we also do have to um, make sure that members of the public can attend the location where we oh, are because it yes, is published. Very good point. Yeah, yeah that's, thank you. Uh, so thank you, you may not want that. it, you know, your house, if you don't want to open it up to members of the public, you may want to choose somewhere else that's got good Wi-Fi signal. So. Very good thought. Yeah. Okay, so um, Ruby will compile that uh, um, item and just mail it out to the task force members, just so we're aware of what we will be doing starting at our next meeting. Are there any public comments for items that were not on our agenda right now, but are under the purview of the task force? Go ahead, sir. This is Sarah Bodner, Policy Director for LCCA, and at the uh, Board of Supervisors hearing last week, when there was some questions that came up around the Farmland Protection Zone in the context of the discussion around the Hoop House Ordinance, there was some new information that was given um, around the number of applicants in the Farmland Protection Zone that were impacted. When we discussed at the task force level, it was, it was heard that three cannabis farms were impacted. And in the discussion with the board last week, I think that you said it was 15 or 18 um, that were impacted by that. And I wanted there, to- 15 and 18 that fall into that, there were four that are actually affected as in they have outdoor cultivation that needs to convert. The others that were approved, their, their application was for mixed light from the beginning. So it didn't really affect them. They didn't have to okay. change their project. Thanks for that clarification. Um, that's, that was what I was gonna request for the next meeting that we get that clarification. Um, I also wanted to clarify, and this was again something that was probably in the minutes, what the task force's recommendation was because it got a little confusing there around, yes, we requested two year extension unless revocation, something, something, something. Could we, um, could we revisit that at the next meeting? Or sure, and I, I think I, I convoluted that a little bit because I stepped in and said the task force did vote to extend it, but then Maria came at the next meeting and explained as to why we couldn't move that forward. So it seemed like we were giving contradictory information, but uh, it was actually- My understanding that the task force recommendation was that, that there was no recommendation for extension if the revocation was not automatic, if it had to go through a revocation procedure. And I was supposed to talk to county council to confirm that, which I did. And so the um, the revocation is not automatic. It would follow the revocation process in our zoning ordinance. There was another request that came from LCCA to see if that is in fact enforceable because you can't get those permits in that zone and that it might render the whole thing null. Is that something that you can still look into with County Council? Was that a formal recommendation? I don't remember that being, I remember that being a comment after the the recommendation. It was in conversation for sure, but we can. But either way, it. yeah, even if it's not, I will ask. Okay, because yeah. I think that's super important so, for those cultivators to know if 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 they're going to have to go through a revocation process or if it doesn't apply because they can't get a mixed light or indoor license anyway. I think that that item was on a previous agenda. If um, Ruby for next agenda, if you'd like to just go pull that back in, okay, and um, we'll revisit that. Okay, thank so, you. Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. I walk out of here and if I don't have it written down, it's like, what? No. Okay. You have to schedule an hour after every meeting. Right? Do your follow up. Indeed, because I have all that time. <laughs> so it looks like we have a hand raised guest. Is that Angela? It is, Maria. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, if you could clarify, <clears throat> excuse me, if you could clarify for me, um, when is the public allowed to comment? Because it seems like there's public members that are allow being allowed to comment during discussions and others are being told to wait for the public comment at the end. So can you clarify sure. for me who's a lot? Thank yeah. you. Um, so at each item, after the task force has done its initial conversation, that's when we ask for public input specific to that item. But additionally, we do have public comment as a standalone item on the agenda, and that is for public comment that is not connected to each individual item. Right, so I think what I'm referring to is that the item that you guys were discussing before the department update, there's a couple people in the conference room there that aren't task force members that were part of the discussion, um, that were discussing it 
I don't know who's in the corner right there. Um, okay. I can't, it's off screen and, but they're not task force members. So I just want to make sure, is there a reason that they don't have to wait until the public comment at the end of the item? Very good sense? question. So we'll make note in the item, um, in the minutes that, because I think you're referring to Sarah, who's not a task force member. However, um, she and Jennifer did do that presentation regarding the recommendations for LCCA. So we'll make sure to note that clearly in the minutes so it differentiates uh, that. Su okay. Supervis who's, who's the, Supervisor who's, Green also interjected without being a member of the task force, as I recall. Okay, is that who's sitting? Uh, is that the gentleman off screen? I can't see him. I just heard a voice. It's the only gentleman in our <laughs> conference room. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. If there is no further public comment, we're going to go ahead and agenda our meeting or adjourn our meeting. Thanks, everybody, for attending.